Imagine a 118-ton freight locomotive driving down a suburban street. No rails, no track, just steel flanged wheels ripping through asphalt like a knife through cardboard, leaving deep grooves in the pavement. There is security posted at the cab, and his job is not to drive this thing. His job is to keep civilians away from the high-voltage cables trailing behind it, because anyone who touches those lines is not walking away from this. At the end of this street sits a town hall that has not had power in several days. Outside, it is minus 20 and dropping. About 35 people across the province have already died from hypothermia, carbon monoxide poisoning, house fires started by desperate improvised heating, and this locomotive, a 25-year-old freight hauler that should be pulling boxcars through southern Quebec right now is about to become the only thing standing between a municipal government and total collapse. That is Boucherville, Quebec, January 1998. Let me tell you how we got here, because this is one of the most insane engineering improvisations in North American history. Between January 4th and January 10th, southern Quebec got buried under what meteorologists still call one of the worst ice storms in Canadian history. Not snow, ice up to about 100 millimeters of freezing rain in the hardest hit areas. The power grid didn't fail, it disintegrated. About 900 transmission towers folded, roughly 24,000 utility poles snapped, more than 4 million people lost power, some for days and others for weeks. The government sent in about 15,000 soldiers, the biggest deployment since Korea, just to keep people from freezing in their own kitchens. The mayor of Boucherville was Francine Gadbois, and she was out of options. No power at City Hall, no heat in the emergency shelters. Hydro-Quebec couldn't give her a timeline because there was nothing left to repair, only things to rebuild. It could be days, or it could be a month. But Gadbois remembered something. Years back, way up north in a mining town called Vermont, they had used locomotives as emergency generators. That is not as crazy as it sounds, because diesel-electric locomotives are basically mobile power plants. The diesel does not drive the wheels. It drives a generator. The generator makes electricity. That electricity runs the traction motors. Disconnect the motors, hook up some cables, and you have got 2,000 horsepower of portable generation capacity sitting on wheels. Gadbois picked up the phone and called CN. They said yes. They sent Locomotive 3502, an MLWM 420 built in Montreal in 1973. A 12-cylinder Alco 251C diesel sat under the hood with 131 liters of displacement and 2,000 horsepower at full throttle. The problem was, the locomotive sat on tracks near a level crossing, and City Hall was 300 meters away on Boulevard de Monarville. You cannot run high-voltage cables through an active disaster zone with ice still falling. So they did something that sounds like it should not be legal. They brought in a crane, lifted the locomotive clean off the rails, dropped it on the street, and let it drive itself to City Hall. On pavement, at walking speed. Those flanged steel wheels designed to grip rail carved deep grooves into the asphalt. You could still see the scars months later. Nobody cared. Road repair was a summer problem. Right now, people were dying. This move looked almost illegal, but it saved lives. Here is where the real danger kicks in, and this is the part most people do not understand. You cannot just plug a locomotive into a building like a Honda generator. The frequency of the alternating current depends entirely on engine speed. The North American grid runs at 60 hertz exactly. Drop to 58 hertz and electric motors start overheating, transformers start humming wrong, and sensitive equipment begins failing. Push to 62 hertz and you overcycle everything, burning out windings, destroying the very equipment you are trying to save. The locomotive was held at a steady engine speed calibrated to produce 60 hertz power, which only produces about 375 kilowatts. That is a fraction of what the engine can do, but it was enough. Canadian National had engineers monitoring that throttle 24 hours a day, watching the frequency like their lives depended on it, because if someone bumped it, everything connected to that locomotive would be smoking wreckage within minutes. And there was another risk that nobody talks about, one that could have turned this rescue into a mass casualty event. 
If someone screwed up the isolation between the locomotive and the grid, that locomotive could have backfed electricity into the transmission lines. Lines that Hydro-Quebec workers assumed were dead. Linemen out there in the ice, climbing poles, splicing cables, working on what they had every reason to believe were safety energized wires, would have been electrocuted by power coming from a freight train parked three blocks away. That is why the electrical connection was guarded. CN sent a second locomotive too, number 3508, same model. This one was supposed to power a high school that had been converted into an emergency shelter. People drove in from Sherbrooke, 160 kilometers away, just to photograph these things sitting in residential neighborhoods. But the school was on the other side of a municipal overpass, and someone did the math. 118 tons on a bridge built for cars. The bridge would buckle. So 3508 sat on the street as backup, never connected. Other towns had the same idea. CN3555 went to Coteau du Lac and powered buildings from trackside. CP Rail sent SD40 number 5417 to Lacole, an old Kansas City Southern unit still in white paint. They had to chisel that locomotive out of a block of ice at the St. Luke shop before they could move it. The railways did not charge anyone a cent. After power was restored, the locomotives returned to Tashiro Yard for repairs because driving on asphalt had chewed up the gear cases and wheels. CN3502 went back to freight duty like nothing happened, just another locomotive. Then they sold it. Ottawa Valley Railway in 1998, Southern Ontario in 1999, Hudson Bay Railway in 2003. And in 2007, CN3502 got scrapped. The locomotive that drove down a suburban street and kept a frozen city alive became scrap metal in Manitoba. No museum, no memorial. There is a small bronze plaque in Boucherville, but most people walk past without looking. February 2021, Texas winter storm Uri. The grid collapsed. Millions were without power, some for days on end. Hundreds died, depending on which official count you look at. Texas had thousands of diesel-electric locomotives sitting on rails owned by Union Pacific and by BNSF, spread across the entire state. Same technology, same capability, same physics. No large-scale locomotive power deployment was attempted. Politicians spent their time on cable news arguing about wind turbines and frozen solar panels, while people froze in their beds, in their cars, in grocery store parking lots. Canada had one mayor with a phone. Texas had an entire government, and no one picked it up. The Alco 251 engine is still in production today, built by Fairbanks Morse. After 1998, people pointed out that Devco Railway in Cape Breton had GP382 locomotives factory equipped with power takeoffs specifically for emergency generation at coal mines. The capability has always existed. What does not always exist is someone willing to use it. Francine Gadbois made that call. Her people survived. CN3502 is gone now, melted down, forgotten. But for a brief window during January 1998, a 25-year-old freight locomotive became the most important machine in Quebec. 